Uh, I would like to uh, also extend my thanks to the players in particular um, for taking the time of their busy schedules to come and contribute to this and all of the people that came, all of you that came and, and the different companies that sponsored tables because it does make a difference. Uh, the health and medical research uh, is like a lot of others around the world in the sense we have basic science and clinical science and population health science. I think what differs from us is two important areas. One is that it's done in partnership with the local clinicians and the local health district. And secondly, we have a commitment to move discoveries as quickly as we can, irrespective of where they're made, into the community and making a difference in both clinical medicine and population health medicine. One of the areas that we've been lacking, that we knew we were lacking in, uh, was pediatric research. And we were lacking in that because the, uh, the individual that started pediatrics in this area, Dr. Ellen James, was retiring and we didn't really have a professor in, of medicine uh, in the area of pediatrics. And what's important for me tonight is to be able to tell you that the university in partnership with both the local health district and the community, particularly Shoehaven and uh, Illawarra clubs, along with Southern Children's Care, will be able to be advertising literally in the next few weeks for international professor of pediatrics to come here, not only to provide leadership in clinical care, but also provide leadership and research in pediatrics. And I think that's what Lee was mentioning. It's very important for us. And I think it's another big step forward for the medical school. So that's, thank you very much for the clubs. Rather than going through um, what we're doing at the, at the Research Institute, and it really is astounding uh, with, with the capacity we have, I want to take you on a rather personal journey that many of you could um, relate to over the last 18 months um, of my life. I want to focus on four people, a colleague of 20 years, um, two family members and a close friend of the family, to tell you why we need to do this research. Recently, uh, a family member died, had breast cancer some years ago, recovered, it returned, they did everything they can, and Phil Klingen, who's a clinician here in the front row, can tell you, when you get metastatic breast cancer, there's just not much we know about it. We don't know who's going to get it, and once it comes back, we don't have a lot of treatment options. The best treatment that was available was given to her. In the end, she didn't live. We need more research on why that happens. Why is it that some women survive and some don't? What causes the recurrence? What treatments can we use? All these are unanswered questions for a very, very common disease. We often hear that we've made great progress in breast cancer, and we have, with over 90% survival. But there's an awful lot of women where that recurrence occurs, and the treatment options aren't there. We don't know why it recurs, and basic research and clinical research is needed. And that's one of the reasons why. But 15 months ago, a colleague of 20 years, when I was working at the Colorado School of Medicine, uh, I worked with a colleague from Canada, from Toronto, a longtime friend, a person not dissimilar from many of the men in this room. Um, at the time he was in his late 50s, slightly overweight, not obese by any stretch, but maybe five kilos over what he should have been. He walked every day. He knew he had high cholesterol, but he was controlled. He happened to be, by the way, a physician. Slightly elevated blood pressure, but not requiring medication. But he went to his doctor every day, I mean every year, regularly. He had a massive heart attack on his vacation um, to the point where they thought he was dead at the time the ambulance came. They picked him up by helicopter and helicoptered him to one of the top heart places in Canada, in the Ontario, it's actually in Ottawa. Um, he spent the next three months there going day by day whether he was going to live or die. But if you actually go back and look at the classic risk factors, he didn't really have many of them. We don't know why about 30 to 40 percent of men, or women by the way, with, who had experienced a heart attack, have it. And once they get it, our ability to treat him, because it was so complicated, was quite limited. He did survive. He's thriving now, which is a really good story. But again, it points out how little we know. 
One of the interesting things is that the Institute is we, we try and gamble and we have, for example, one group that we're funding right now with our own funds that we raise through activities such as this, which is what I'll call a, a long shot in, in like in a horse race, but they're looking at a lipid that may well turn out to be a better predictor than cholesterol if it proves out the way they think it would, may prove to be nothing. But there's so much we don't know about heart disease. We think it's it's simple, you have one and you can survive and go, but that's not the case. Almost half the people who have one die the first time. He happened to survive, so he's very fortunate. The third case is a close family friend, or particularly my wife's. Um, this is a girl who has an eating disorder. She's been hospitalized, I think now three or four times for over a month each time, has tried to take her life on numerous occasions, um, still, is extraordinarily fragile. And the, the fatality rate when you have eating disorders is extraordinarily high. And it's not just girls that get it, it's boys and girls, although girls are the dominant one. We know extraordinarily little about why eating disorders occur, from a physiological imbalance to a psychological imbalance. We know extraordinarily little about how to treat them successfully, either from a psychological treatment or from a medication treatment. We know almost nothing. And yet this is a disorder that's common in the community and it may affect some of your own families and friends. She's doing better. I hope that she continues to get better, but the odds are actually against her because we don't know what to do. And to me that's tragic and that's one of the examples of why we continue to do health and medical research. And the fourth example that has occurred in the last 18 months, all of these are in the last 18 months I want to point out, is a family member who uh, gave birth to a baby with a situation called hypo hypoplastic left heart syndrome in which the heart itself, in this particular case, the left ventricular, was underdeveloped. Normally, if it's caught through a series of three different surgeries, you can probably survive into your 20s or 30s or maybe beyond that, although there's very little data on that. In this particular case, the image was misread or missed. So the young baby went almost four days without treatment and intervention, which caused most of the organs to be severely damaged. How much brain damage is, has occurred, we don't know yet. Um, she stayed virtually her entire first nine months in the hospital, in a, probably the, at least the top or the second best hospital in all of North America. Put on a waiting list because she was gonna die for a heart transplant got the heart transplant, and now may live, they're saying, to maybe four to six years of age. Beyond that, there's no guarantees. In this particular case, the problem was, it's easy to blame the doctor, it really is. But the problem is the technology, the imaging quality when you get to some of these things is just not what it should be. And research has to be done to improve imaging because imaging is gonna become the mainstay of medicine in not too distant future. We have a group working headed up by Anatoly Rosenfeld at the university that's looking at that. But in this little girl's case, had the image been clear, had it been picked up, they would have treated her at the point of delivery, they would have had the surgeries, and she'd have at least a lifespan of 20 to 30 years, and in that time, of course, many other discoveries will occur. Now her guaranteed lifespan is four to six years, and that's it. That's why research is being done. It's not being done to make us feel good about ourselves and what we do. But if you think about your own lives in the last 18 months, just the people that have touched you, your family, your friends, your colleagues, there'll be similar stories. There's a lot that we know, but there's a whole lot that we don't know. The kind of support that you give tonight and the players that come and make these things possible and your participation is what allows that research to continue. And I would ask you to think about yourselves, about in the last 18 months, and what's happened to you or your friends. And that's why this is a journey, it's a long journey, we have bumps along the way, but we're making incredible progress, both here, the rest of Australia, and around the world. And it will make a difference. It'll make a difference to your children and your grandchildren, and hopefully they won't have some, some of the problems I talked about with those four people. So I thank you very, very much for coming. Have a great night.